In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God is one. Christ is risen. Truly is risen. Christos Anesti. Christos Anesti. Christ is risen. Truly is risen. O Lord, midway through the feast, give drink to my thirsty soul from the living waters of right belief. You, O Savior, proclaim to everyone, let whoever is thirsty come to me and drink. You are the fountain of life, O Christ our God, glory to you. This is the Apolitikion of mid-Pentecost, which we heard this past Wednesday at the exact midpoint of the 50 days between the Feast of Pascha and Pentecost. In the Divine Liturgy Gospel, we read for the Feast of Mid-Pentecost, in the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. John 7, 14. The feast in question is the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, which commemorates the Israelites wandering in the desert for 40 years when they lived under tents and, ta and tabernacles. It was their custom that on the final day of the feast, the Jews drew water from the pool of Siloam to be mixed with wine and poured at the altar of the temple in remembrance of the water that Moses drew from the rock that we read in the book of Exodus chapter 17. The Feast of Tabernacles served as the middle link between the Jewish Passover or Pascha which recalls God's deliverance of his people from Egyptian Pharaoh, and the Jewish Pentecost, which recalls old Israel reaching Mount Sinai to receive the law of God, and then its eventual entry into the Promised Land. When Jesus had preached in the temple, he had healed the paralytic man at the Sheep's Gate Pool, the gospel reading which the church prescribed this past Sunday and was about to give sight to the blind man at the pool of Siloam, which the church will recall this upcoming Sunday. The Apolitikion of Mid-Pentecost announces the waters of true worship from the Holy Spirit, which Christ will give us to drink, just as he gave the Samaritan woman to drink. On this day, this Sunday, we commemorate that encounter between Christ and the Samaritan woman. If you notice, a recurrent theme found in the Gospel readings for these three consecutive Sundays is the theme of water. Likewise, it is important to note that on the Feast of Pascha, many catechumens were baptized into Christ. Many catechumens were baptized, which is why we chanted, as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, Alleluia, instead of the usual Trisagion hymn that we chant on regular Sundays, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal. This is because the catechumens received their baptismal waters during this Paschal period, from Pascha and on. Consequently, Another recurrent theme that we find in these couple of gospel readings as well is that of en enlightenment, being illumined, having not been able to see like the, blind man, like the blind man in next Sunday's gospel and seeing Christ like the Samaritan woman that said, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? On a side note, I'd like to point at the fact that during the Triodion period of Great Lent, the Church barely presents to us the readings from the Gospel of John due to its high level of Christology, which is the understanding of the person of Christ. Also because of its symbolism and its high theological discourse. Catechumens, preparing themselves to receive illumination were not deemed ready to be exposed to the 
death of this gospel. But on the night of Pascha, at the climax of the feast, and having received their baptismal waters and being illuminated through the Holy Spirit, the church finally prescribes from that moment on to Pentecost, the Gospel of St. John. And I quote, in the beginning was the word. It is as if they have finally graduated and can now understand the mysteries of Christ because although the law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, John 1:17. Those catechumens who were not able to see or understand the Gospel of John, still being blinded and in darkness, and having been brought to the light by Christ through the waters of baptism, are now capable of seeing and understanding. Again, the recurrent themes are water and illumination and light. So. What is the meaning of water in scripture? What is the relationship between water and light or illumination? Where and how do these themes converge? Water is a very important element in scripture. Throughout the Bible, water plays an important and mystical role in human existence and in man's relationship with God, the creator. First, Whenever we hear of water in the Bible, we think of life. In the book of Genesis, we read that creation began when the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God commanded that the waters bring forth an abundance of living souls. Water has the capacity to produce and sustain life. It quenches thirst, as I mentioned earlier, in the story of Moses striking the rock in the desert to produce water for the parched wanderers. It should not come as a surprise that up to 60% of the human adult body is composed of water. On the other hand, water has also the capacity to destroy life, as seen in the story of Noah and the ark in the book of Genesis where the earth and all the inhabitants were drowned as a result of their life and sin. While the waters of the Red Sea parted to allow the Hebrews to pass over in safety and thus preserve their life, the same waters came rushing upon the Pharaoh and his army, drowning them and thus killing them. So the water that can produce life can also be an agent that brings upon death. Furthermore, drinking too much water can cause a fatal condition called water toxemia, also known as water intoxication or water poisoning. It's a potentially fatal condition that occurs by drinking too much water. And no, Father Joseph is not allowing or justifying those that like to drink Coke or pop to continue drinking pop. You have to drink water, but just not too much. So how can an element of life also cause death? How is this understood in the scope of scripture? One can understand this dichotomy of the constructive yet destructive power of water present in the Bible by realizing that scripturally speaking, water can also symbolize the word of God, which is sharper than a two-edged sword and also having the capacity to cleanse. The, wa the Word of God can do both things. We see this symbolism present in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, and I quote, in order to make her holy by cleansing her, in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the Word. Here the Word of God acts as a cleansing agent like water since the word cleanses his bride, the church. It seemed obvious for St. Paul to find this correlation between water and the word of God due to the cleansing effect of water and to the fact that the word of God cleanses the soul and purifies the person from sin. And this type of water, God's word, leads to an overflow of the Holy Spirit through grace, 
that constitutes life eternal as Christ tells the Samaritan woman when he says, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of gushing, of water gushing up to eternal life. Was this spring of water gushing up to eternal life the well where the Samaritan woman encountered Christ on her way to draw water to quench her, her thirst? Was that what Christ was referring to? A great teacher of scripture from the second and third century compared scripture to Jacob's well through the following analogy. The scriptures, therefore, are introductions and are called Jacob's well. Once they have now been accurately understood, one must go from them to Jesus, that he may freely give us the fountain of water that leaps into eternal life. All do not draw from Jacob's well that is the scriptures in the same way. Some drink deeply, others drink more like Jacob's livestock. Yet the Samaritan woman ended up grasping this mystery which led her to her, convert, to, to her conversion to Christ. Being baptized on the holy day of Pentecost by the apostles and thus earning her the name Fotini, which means the enlightened one or illumined one. And through her example, Saint Fotini guided many to a deeper understanding of the relationship between water and illumination in scripture, a means of deification or theosis, which means becoming divine, Christ-like, holy. This occurs in a threefold process Number one, purification. Number two, illumination. And number three, deification. In St. Fotini's life, we see the perfect embodiment of the three stages of spiritual life as formulated by St. Dionysius the Aeropagite. Purification, the first stage, is an ongoing process in our lives and is characterized by our repentance. During purification, we continually renounce the old being and strive to become clothed with the new being in the Holy Spirit. In the case of Saint Fotini, we see this in verse 28, and I quote, Then the woman left her jar behind and went back to the city. She came to the well seeking for water to quench her temporary and earthly thirst. Little did she know that her encounter with Jesus Christ, the Word of God incarnate, would prompt her to repent of her former lifestyle, leaving it all behind just as she left her water jar behind. It no longer mattered for her. Illumination, the second stage, is characterized by the enlightenment of the soul to better see the inner principles of creation and participation in the Holy Spirit. The result is the purification of the, of the darkened mind, the nous, and the ability to see things that were unclear before to the heart, the eyes of the soul. After being illumined through grace, one acquires knowledge of divine and human things and experiences the revelation of mysteries of the kingdom of heaven because he gains unceasing knowledge of the kingdom of heaven and he gains the, the knowledge of the reality of God which is impressed deeply within the core of his or her being. We see this in verse 29 in the case of Saint Fotini where she says to her people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. The Samaritan woman who has now acquired light, Fotini, could now see her own shortcomings which were hidden in the darkest places of her soul. But it was now illumined by the word of God that allowed her to see who she really was and who Christ really is. And I quote, 
I who speak to you am he. That's what Christ responded. Finally, deification, the third and final stage, or theosis, results in man's becoming a theologian in the true sense of the word, being divine or Christ-like. In this phase, man communes with the angelic powers, approaches the uncreated light, and the deaths of God are revealed to him through the Spirit. At this stage, this person is in a mystical communion with God and knows many things which are hidden to others, including the mysteries that exist in Holy Scripture. The Gospel gives us a glimpse of her reaching this stage in verse 39. And I quote, Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. After having received the baptismal waters, the true waters gushing up eternal life by the holy apostles themselves on Pentecost, Saint Fotini was filled with the Holy Spirit and therefore illumined. This led us, this leads us to the highest characteristics of water in scripture. The highest symbolism is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the fountain of water which flows with eternal life. It is no coincidence that the Gospel reading for the Sunday of Pentecost reads Jesus' proclamation. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, Christ referring about the Spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive. John 7, verses 37 to 39. My brethren, at our baptismal, at, at, at our baptism, the Holy Spirit is infused in waters, and through it we receive illumination through chrismation, which is the seal of the Holy Spirit. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom, says Christ in John chapter 3, verse 5. Thus, St. Fotini, the Enlightened One, brought many people to Christ, the Word of God, which cleanses, purifies. She contributed to the spread of Christianity throughout the ancient world. And having purified her soul and found illumination, she reached deification by receiving the crowns of martyrdom with her two sons and her sister. <clears throat> now, how does this all apply in our lives, my brethren? Very simple. It's not only by receiving baptism and being chrismated. It's an ongoing process in our lives. We have to quench our thirst in the well of Scripture. We have to be illumined by Scripture. We have to read Scripture and have a passion for it and love it. And thus, when we become ourselves a light in this world, then we can help those that are in darkness to be illumined. But it can only happen if we dwell in Scripture. So, my brethren, let us imitate St. Fotini's example of life where she got purified, illumined, and deified. Let us drink from the well that quenches our, thir our eternal thirst. That is the Word of God. And let us become light that pours out to all those in this darkened world. Amen. <laughs>